Welcome everyone. I'm Linda Rios. It's a great honor to be hosting uh, today's panel, the Itai Dam Analyzing the Reassessment of its Treaty. Paraguay Speaks Australia 2021 is sponsored by the University of Melbourne. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of, on which we are meeting. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may attend this virtual event today. You are attending a live webinar that is also recorded or for our YouTube channel. This webinar will consist of two presentations given by our two speakers today, Dr. Christine Folch and Dr. Gerardo Blanco. We also look forward to hearing from our audience today. At the end of uh, those two presentations, participants will be able to ask any questions to our speakers and share any comments using the Zoom Q&A function. Participants can also join the conversation on social media through our hashtag PYSpeaks2021. Uh, now, I would like to introduce our special guest today, Dr. Christine Folch. Dr. Folch serves as Assistant Professor of Cultural Anthropology and holds a secondary appointment as Assistant Professor of Environmental Sciences and Policy at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, USA. Dr. Folch is a scholar of energy politics, natural resources, and environment in Latin America, with an attention to how nature is intertwined with power struggles, national identities, and history. She received her PhD in cultural anthropology from the City University of New York, and her BA in history, cum laude, from Harvard College. Dr. Folch has written extensively on water, energy, sovereignty in South America, as well as cuisine and culture. Her new book, Hydropolitics, the Itaipu Dam, Sovereignty and the Engineering of Modern South America, published by Princeton University Press in 2019. Draw on more than a decade of ethnography among energy elites in Paraguay as well as Brazil, as they administer the resources of the world's largest hydroelectric dam, Itaipu, Binational, Paraguay, Brazil, to show how electricity is tied up with politics and sovereignty. Dr. Folch leads Itaipu Post 2023 a research team that develops analysis and recommends a strategy for the upcoming renegotiation of the Itaipu Dam Treaty and was named a 2021 Andrew Carnegie Fellow. Welcome, Dr. Falch. Thank you. Um, so it is a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. Um, I am so thrilled to have been invited. And I love the vision for what you're doing. So the first thank you is to say thank you to um, the, the organizers of this excellent conference. Um, and then also to just say what a pleasure it is to get to um, speak with Dr. Blanco. Um, he is uh, a well-respected scholar and it is always, always great to talk with him about, about anything, um, but especially about the subject that we'll speak on today. Um, so a little bit about me. So I study negotiations and other decision-making processes as historical and cultural processes. That is to say, I'm, I'm really interested in the values and the priorities that guide choices and, and the mental frameworks that that set out options and that then get acted upon. So today I'm, I'm going to bring this analysis to what is arguably the most important international energy negotiation of the first half of the 21st century worldwide, which is Itaipu Binational Dam, uh, a massive hydroelectric dam co-owned by Brazil and Paraguay. Um, and and I, I want to acknowledge that I think a lot of us on this call maybe know maybe know a lot about it. Um, but I also think that it's really important, the vision of this, of this conference, to open Paraguay to a larger public. And so I want to speak also to people who are not necessarily very familiar with Itaipu. Um, 
And I, I want to start, uh, I should share my screen so I can um, give you some, some data. Uh, but the first thing I want to say about Itaipu is it's really important for Paraguay and beyond to, to break this expectation that Itaipu and other really, really important issues are the subject of discussion and research that only belong to a certain group of professionals or certain kind of professions, um, in this case, engineering. Um, this is, this is the kind of work that we have done here at Duke through Duke Engage, for example. We focus on bringing a multidimensional and interdisciplinary perspective on hydroelectricity in Itaipu Dam. Um, and so I, I want to argue and I want to assert that we need to include various areas and multiple ways of knowing to tackle an issue as complex as energy um, so that renewable energy powers the development of Paraguay and the region. There are many, many voices in Paraguay, many different perspectives, and that's actually great. That's actually a strength. Um, I, I want to start by saying that, you know, it's super, it's very important that the academy be independent um, so that it is able to be transformed into a tool that both listens to and articulates the different perspectives in the country in order to convert these perspectives into research and into studies that make an impact on the quality of development in Paraguay. Um, and I think that's why this conference, Paraguay Speaks, a conference on Paraguay with Paraguay to people who are not Paraguayan, um, is so important. Um, not just in the university, so not just academics, but to develop the basis for a sustainable development in Paraguay that works, that transforms the country. Um, I, I even want to make a statement. Um, I think that Itaipu should not, it's not just that it should be talked about in a multidisciplinary way. I think it should be a topic of study in Paraguay from elementary school onward. Um, and so that's how I want to start by saying, let's talk about this. All right, so Paraguay sits at an important crossroads. And today I wanna to do more than just tell you about it. I want to invite dialogue and participation about this crossroads. Um, and I, I want to, uh, I, and I wanna make a claim that I'm asking young people to not just wait for space to be made for them, but take the space and dialogue about it. So what is this crossroads? Well, Paraguay today sits on top of a massive surplus of renewable energy. In a time when we hear of the growing threat of climate change and the need to decarbonize the global economy, Paraguay has an unprecedented resource. It co-owns Itaipu by National Dam. Um, and as we'll talk about, it's up for renegotiation soon. Uh, this is the world's largest hydroelectric dam in terms of energy generation, and it's equally owned by Paraguay and Brazil. Ten of the turbines are Paraguayan, ten of the turbines are Brazilian. Um, and it sits on the water border of, of the two countries. Obviously, it's a hydroelectric dam. The Paraná River, which is, is the border between those two countries, and then becomes the border between Paraguay and Argentina. Today, Paraguay's half of Itaipu can produce enough electricity to power three Paraguays. Um, most years, it generates somewhere around 95,000 gigawatt hours. Um, and this average production could power like 15% of Brazil, a third of the state of California and the US, or seven Paraguays. But this capacity, this energy is, uh, uh, is affected by climate change and deforestation. Um, so that number is not, is not always promised. Um, a little bit about the timeline and key dates. In 1973, a treaty was signed between Brazil and Paraguay to start this dam. The first turbines started generating electricity in 84, and in 2023, key parts of the treaty are going to be revised, revisado, reviewed per the treaty. The question for Paraguay is not just what's behind, but what's ahead. Is it more of the same, or is it something new? Um, and so, I want to assess the negotiations by assessing the past um, and uh, you know, looking backwards in order to look forward. 
Um, and so to help us do this, I, I want to give a little bit of uh, a little bit of training on uh, interest-based negotiation theory um, to help us understand how to assess the past and how the assessment of the past can help us understand the options and the opportunity ahead. And the first thing in interest-based negotiation is this distinction between a position and an interest. A bad strategy for negotiation is to come in with a position, to start with positions and argue between them. A better way to start a negotiation is to first do a lot of research. Um, because positions are superficial. They could be numbers, they could be actions. They're important, but they're not the right place to start. Instead, interests are the right place to start. And interests are much deeper. Interests are not necessarily obvious. Um, and a, a way to move forward in a, in a successful negotiation is to first start by analyzing the interests of the other party and your own interests. And there are multiple interests. This is not just, you know, there's one and one. Um, and then to proceed by uh, figuring out not just what are all the interests, but what are the top interests. And then to find positions that satisfy the top interests. And the reason to do this is that when you, when you negotiate in this way, you are changing the dynamic of a negotiation. Um, this is particularly important for Paraguay in the situation of Itaipu because of the vast asymmetry between the two countries. Brazil is much bigger than Paraguay. Brazil has a much larger economy than Paraguay. Uh, Itaipu represents a lot more for Paraguay than Brazil in terms of um, ener the energy, how much energy it produces and what that, can, what that can mean within Paraguay as a, as a percentage of Paraguay's overall energy matrix. Um, and so given the asymmetry and given the challenges of Paraguay's history with Brazil, uh, which is a, a long-standing history and includes a, a war in the 19th century um, that Paraguay lost to the combined forces of Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. So there's a lot going on for Paraguay and it's, it's filled with a lot of complexity and asymmetry. How do you approach this negotiation? Thinking through interests and finding, finding positions that meet shared interests switches the asymmetrical dynamic into something more productive together. Um, so an interest-focused negotiation lets you change from being a win-lose uh, dynamic to a win-win, where both sides can win, where both sides get what they want, where both sides have their interests met. Um, and it allows uh, negotiators to expand options. Um, and so as we go into an assessment of this renegotiation or revision, review of the Itaipu Treaty, how it has operated in the past, um, particularly in terms of energy pricing and energy distribution, so the heart of what Itaipu is about. This, this question about interests is really important because it helps us think about strategy. Um, and so, you know, here at Duke, we've done a lot of analysis, uh, both on Paraguay and Brazil, to try to learn more about what the interests of the countries are in Itaipu. And when you analyze Brazil's history in Itaipu, when you look at their actions, the actions of the government, when you look at the archival documents, you see, and when you look in the present, you see that Brazil's interest in Itaipu, the number one interest in Itaipu, has been the electricity and using that energy for industrialization. This historical interest is still Brazil's interest and it allows um, a laser focus in the country in terms of what the country is hoping for from Itaipu and therefore in the revision, the review, the renegotiation of 2023. Um, now, Paraguay's interest in Itaipu historically has been rent. And when we talk about energy rent, we talk about money that goes to the government to then be redistributed according to the priorities and the agenda of the government. And so this focus has been on money, on how to obtain as much money as possible from uh, energy transfers to Brazil or from government fees within um, 
within the within the dam. Um, and this focus means that that the attention in Paraguay has been on getting money and getting it to the government. Um, and assessing the past between Paraguay and Brazil allows us to ask this question of you know whose interests worked more for the country. Um, because Brazil's interest was a focus on energy for industrialization, that means that Itaipu became a tool for Brazil's population to be employed in, in industries that produce for the world. Um, and that meant that Brazil had a plan, an industrialization plan that predated Itaipu, that Itaipu actually was part of executing. In Paraguay's case, the focus was not on executing a plan. It was on getting money and then having that money serve the agenda of the government of the day. And Paraguayans need to have a conversation about whether they're satisfied with that focus and that impact. Um, now, how that actually affects the renegotiation is the following. Um, so because Brazil's interest in the past has been so clear, uh, the, the positions that the government gives, um, representatives of the government, civil society, the private sector, in terms of what's coming for Itaipu is very laser focused. They have, a, they have a plan for what they want the energy to do, and they have a plan for the out, what they hope for as the outcome of the, the renegotiation um, that comes in 2023. Um, and that focus is on lowering the price of the electricity um, in order to make it even more cost competitive and therefore to make Brazil, goods made in Brazil even more cost competitive um, for the sake of growing its economy. Uh, whereas in Paraguay, uh, because the interest has been rent, rent for the government in the past, um, this has led to uh, competing objectives. And so one of the differences is that in Brazil, you're going to hear a focus on a pretty clear focus on what needs to happen from multiple sectors. Um, whereas in Paraguay, there are a couple of different options on the table being discussed in civil society, and it is excellent. Um, but that conversation is happening now, not in the past. Um, and so there isn't the same laser focus on how an objective is going to satisfy the interests of Paraguay. Um, and so the work that we've been doing here at Duke has been arguing that uh, it's in Paraguay's interest to learn and to, to sort of learn from its past and to focus instead of on the rent, on the electricity and to focus on the electricity as the real resource in Itaipu um, and actually the surplus that Paraguay currently enjoys. Of, of electricity, um, that this massive surplus is a unique opportunity for Paraguay to do something really creative to build sustainable development in the country. Um, and so that is the basic argument that I want to present today as an opening to dialogue and an opening to conversation. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, uh, my esteemed colleague here. And um, so Gerardo Blanco, Dr. Blanco is, uh, you know, you can see from his CV that he has, uh, you know, he has academic publications. He has all the right notes um, in terms of, um, in, in terms of being a, a scholar, being a professor, and that's actually how I met him. Um, but uh, what he has proposed for today. Uh, reveals his heart, uh, which is that Dr. Blanco believes that energy is Paraguay's greatest wealth. Um, and that's why he wants to reflect with us today on the question um, that has kept him from sleeping for 10 years. Um, how do you transform, how do we transform Paraguay's energy into development? In 2010, he returned to Paraguay after studying abroad and founded the Energy System Research Group, HISE, um, for its initials in Spanish, at the Polytechnic Faculty of the National University of Asuncion, where he's trained more than 60 youth so far in scientific life, publishing together with his students more than 130 scientific articles in journals, conferences, and books. Um, and as an aside, I, I will testify that, uh, you know, 
Dr. Blanco's commitment to the scholarship of his students is one of his strongest, strongest commitments. Um, I've seen this throughout the years. It is, um, it is quite remarkable um, and quite admirable. Uh, he also has experience as a consultant for international institutions, helping, helping so far um, five countries draw up public energy plans and policies. Um, on August 7th, 2010, he was appointed by the Paraguayan president as the first scientist who's a member of the Itaipu Binational Governing Board. Um, and he accepted this great challenge with the main objective of serving and being useful to his country. Um, so with that introduction of somebody who is so committed to science and scholarship and research, but also service, public service, I, I yield the floor to uh, Dr. Blanco and we'd love to hear from you. You're on mute. It's less than a little. Now, thank you. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> Actually, uh, you are also a very esteemed colleague and I, I all, always <clears throat> very thrilled and very, very delighted every uh, time that I have the opportunity to talk with you, with Juan Carlos, with and see Daniel and your lovely family. First of all, I would like to, to uh, thank the organization of, of this conference for, for having me here. And, and actually, uh, I, I would like also to, to, to thank all the, the people that contribute to, uh, with me in order to, to have these, these ideas that I would like to share with you. The title of the presentation is Facts, Not Opinions. Yes, because now with the position in the government that I have, it's very difficult to me to, to have my own opinions. And that's why I, I, I decide to talk more than opinions, facts. And anyway, I would like to, 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 to make a disclaimer for, uh, out at the beginning of, of my presentation saying that all the thing that I, I will I will say it here is on my uh, single re responsibility. That means that I am in chair of, 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 of anything that is, is presenting here. Okay. Uh, firstly, I would like to share with you this, this quote that I love, which belongs to Daniel Patrick Moy Nihan. And he said that everyone is entitled to, to his own opinions, but no his own facts. And it's very frequent that we confuse the slight difference uh, between facts and, and opinions. And I think that every uh, debate, every dialogue, or every reflection that we base on facts uh, are more strong uh, in order to build up over uh, over it uh, a consensus of a, a agreement. That's why uh, I would like to to discuss with you, to share with you, to reflect with you uh, uh, today four facts and seven corollaries. That's a, a fancy word that I will explain later. And two ideas. Okay, the first fact is that the Annex C of the Treaty of Itaipu must be revised in the year 2023. Here I am going to rely on all the uh, great things that uh, Christina already present. Uh, and and as, you, as you see, uh, the Annex C basically uh, consists on the way that Itaipu uh, calculate uh, set its tariff. And according to the Annex C, the Annex C have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven components. And the sum of all, the, of, of, uh, all these components, the, when we sum up these components, we, we have the cost of electricity service, which divided by, by the accumulated monthly power that the plant has available, we have the tariff. Okay, 
Among the, the component of the ADEX, Annex C, we have the dividends, which is the, the rent, let's say, the profit that uh, ETPU paid and then let Electrobras brass based on the assets that they contribute, $100 million, and is uh, adjusted uh, based on, on uh, 1975. And, and then we have, yes? Sorry, your slides are not, are not passing through. No? No. If would you mind to sort of uh, share it again? Okay, here. And uh, now? Yeah, no. Yeah, no, 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 no it's going well. Although okay. it, didn't, it didn't even start from the beginning, so maybe if you could. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um, technical difficulties. Um, okay, this is the, the code that I mentioned, and it's our agenda. And the first fact is that uh, the Annex C of the Treaty of Itaipu must be revised in the year 2023. And the Annex C basically consists on the calculation of the unit cost of electricity, uh, so-called a uh, tariff of Itaipu. The Annex C has seven components, the dividends, the financing expenses, the capital amortization, the, the royalties, the administrative, compensation, the, the OPEX, and also have an account balance, which uh, control and, and adjust the difference amongst one year to, to another. The dividends and are, as I said before, 12% uh, uh, based on, on the assets and the financial debts, uh, you know that that is going to change from uh, 2023. And then we have the royalties and the administration companies that are, the royalties are, are, are financial funds that the states receive and also the, the companies, the contract companies and the and Electrobras. And then we have the operator, the OPEX, which the, the, the budget that ETAPU needs in order to, uh, to run. And when we sum up all these values, we have the cost of electricity electricity service, which divided by, by the accumulated monthly uh, power, we, we finally have the or set the tariff of the table. And, and here we, 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 we can see that we have a tariff of power. That means that we need to define uh, the difference among power and energy. An analogy that I used to applied uh, in, in order to, to explain this uh, is imagine that we want to uh, open a, a bakery, a panaderia, and we, we, we are going to, to be the biggest bakery in the world, and we are not sure that we are going to have enough demand for, for the bread. But anyway, we, we want to, to do that, and then we need to assure the cash flow that we need uh, in order to um, accomplish with all the, the, the financial uh, commitment that we need to take in order to uh, co construct or build up the, the bakery. And then we, we have the opportunity then, and an alternative is to just yes, to rent the oven, yes, for bakeries, and the bakeries then sell the electricity <laughs> because uh, in that in that way we 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 have the the certain that we need how large or how big is the capacity of our oven. For instance, we 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 may uh, know that our oven is able to uh, produce one hundred. Uh, bread per hour, then a bakery uh, rent, uh, let's say, the capacity of 80 bread per hour, and another bakery rent the capacity of 20 bread per hour. Then our uh, bakery, our biggest bakery, uh, we are we are not, let's say, exposed exposed to to the volatility. Of, of the bread prices or the bread demand. We just rent our ovens and then the bakeries which contract that capacity 
is in charge of cells after the the the, the breath, and 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 take all the all the risk from uh, uh, the the breath market. Uh, and Itepu makes something similar to this, and then we we can think that actually Itepu is not selling energy. It's not selling electricity. Itaipu is renting its uh, turbines, and and then uh, and then Electrobras rents some part of, of, of the turbines, and that is the power of Itaipu. And after that, Electrobras and 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 they are in charge of uh, sell the energy or the breath in our example. That is the first corollary uh, uh, that said that Itaipu sells power, not energy. And corollary is a, a statement that provides from a proved statement. And it's like a conclusion from the fact. And, and this is our first corollary. Uh, Itaipu sells power, nor, not energy. Our second facts or our fact number two is Paraguay's power demand is growing at a very fast pace, exceeding the rate of the energy growth. According to estimation, here is the, the uh, definition of color. It's, it's up. Uh, sorry, here we have. According to for, forecast uh, team made by Hise in, in 2018, here we have the probability of power deficit, power, uh, remember the, the urban capacity. Uh, here we have the probability that in Paraguay we have deficit of power and according to the demand growth, and we, we can see that we, we have a probability different of, of zero, which certainly is, if the probability is zero, that means that it's not going to happen with uh, certain. But from 2029, we have already an uncertain uh, probability. That means that we may have deficit in uh, power in Paraguay. And about 1930, uh, three, four, we have a probability of 100 or one, which means that we, it's, it's, it's all, almost, uh, all, uh, almost for sure that we are going to have probability, uh, we, we, are, we are going to have a power deficit in Paraguay. On the other hand, our energy, this means that uh, according to our uh, research margin, is let's say delayed from from the from the power uh, demand yeah and that's it relates on the fact that the energy of or the electricity consumption in paraguay is basically a house a household uh, weight that means that uh, we, we 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 have mostly of our electricity are consumed by the people at their houses. And that means that many people demand electricity at the very same time when the people are arriving at uh, their houses after the work. And that means that at seven, uh, uh, a few hours a day, we, we have a very demand, a high demand of a very, a sharp demand of, of, of electricity and in comparison with other uh, hours of the day. And here we have then the, the second corollary that is Paraguay will sooner pay for all its power than will use all its energy. <laughs> and if we uh, want to, sh to change this, then we need to think in what uh, Christine was saying before, and also from his, uh, we have uh, we, uh, several uh, papers published uh, on that direction that say that we want we, we we should consume our electricity in industries, 
because the industries had very, a, very, a very flat uh, profile of consumptions, which actually helped to uh, tie the power and the energy demand. And, but if we want to uh, encourage uh, uh, industrial con consumption, we need to uh, conquer several uh, cross-cutting uh, needs that Paraguay already don't have. That is our infrastructure, that, that is uh, human resources, uh, educated uh, human resources, um, and other um, uh, other dimension that we we need to change the paradigm in Paraguay, and this is the the fact three, and that Paraguay needs financial resources and competitive tariff for transforming uh, its energy into development, uh, uh, financial resources for investing in infrastructure and also for investing in education and other uh, needs that Paraguay uh, have to conquer in order to have the, the possibility of attract investment in the industry, for instance, which also needs uh, a competitive tariff uh, of electricity. And we have an opportunity also here because we, we are already in the uh, in an ongoing uh, demographic dividend in Paraguay, that means that our this is our that, that, uh, demographics uh, pyramid parent, uh, and and we see that now in the in the next years we are going to have most of the pop our population in a product uh, productive uh, ages, and if we think about uh, the financial resources we need to understand firstly the financial flow of the paraguayan and, and, uh, energy <laughs> christine said that the prima primarily uh, interest of paraguay at the beginning of it was ceasing, uh, ceasing uh, rent and and here we have how is the west the, the, the way that itaipu capture the the financial uh, funds the, the flow and how that flow comes to paraguay and how is divided in paraguay uh, both and the, and electroblast paid for each of the annex c components here we don't have because this is analyzed uh, from 2023 that's why we we don't have any more debt here we we just have uh, four um, components of the Annex C, the dividend, the royalty, the reimbursement, and the OPEX. And both and then Electrobras paid these components to Itaipu in the proportion of their contracts of power, of, of, in the proportion of their power contracts. That's mean that's because the, uh, the power contract of Electrobras is is bigger than the power contract of Ande. Ele Electrobras at the uh, end of the day is paying more from each uh, Annex C component. And also Electrobras paid an additional uh, uh, topics, which is the compensation for, for, setting, for energy setting, uh, which is paying uh, to Itaipu and Itaipu is transferring directly to Paraguay. Here in Itaipu, only stop the OPEX. This is a, a mistake here. The OPEX has not to, to, to be to be to Paraguay. This is a mistake in this slide. Sorry for that. And and to Paraguay goes dividend, royalties, reinsurance, reforming and compensation. And the dividends and the reforms return to Ande. The royalties come to the countries, the municipalidades y gobernaciones, and part of, of, of it, and, uh, and part of there it goes to the treasury, the financial uh, ministry, the Ministerio Hacienda. And all the compensation goes to Fonacide. This situation is going to remain, uh, Paraguay have already uh, have still a surplus. Once 
Paraguay keeps we have surplus and we, we, we are analyzing this from a power approach. Here we can see that um, Ande is ending to uh, is going to, to pay all the component C related to the annex C, uh, the energy the Paraguayan energy in Itaipu. And Electrobras is is going to still pay only the compensation for the remaining of energy of electricity that uh, and or Paraguay cannot come soon for the reason that I mentioned before that power uh, the the energy consumption is have a delay uh, from the power uh, demand <laughs> and that means that the dividends and the performance the uh, and is going to be paying uh, by itself because you you can see here that it's going to to return to and all the the amount that uh, it's paying and at the end of the day also and is going to pay all the royalties and the compensation of, uh, sorry the, comp the the royalties to the uh, municipalities and <laughs> and gobernación eh? and also the royalties which co go to the uh, government budgets from the ministerio de hacienda and only Fonacide and is going to be declining is going to receive the compensation for the energy, the Paraguayan energy that is still consum uh, consuming in, in Brazil. <laughs> Here we we can we can uh, make a, 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 a analysis or reflection that that means that because in 2023 we 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 need to adjust or set a new architecture of, of the annex C. <laughs> and from that point of view in about 10 years yes from 2023 and is going to be paying almost everything that's going to paraguay that means that if we adjust the royalties or we adjust the dividends or we adjust the reimbursement of 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 the annex c that's the, the formulas that uh, calculate these uh, components at the uh, at the end uh, of the day and is going to pay that and if and is going to pay that that means that we the consumer of the client of and we are going to pay that and that means that maybe it's not um, a good idea to focus just on adjust the royalties, the dividends of the reforms of, of Ande. And in because uh, the compensation is going to be the, the financial flow that's going to come, still comes from, from uh, abroad. And, and also, um, according to what we were saying, uh, the royalties and the reinforcements which are indexed to, to energy, uh, and it's going to be paying even if that, that energy is not being uh, consumed by, by and. And that's uh, allow us to, to change a new way to see this situation. And maybe the best situation could be a, a situation where the royalties, at least the royalties and their reinforcement were paid by the country which uh, actually uh, consuming that electricity. <laughs> and in, in this case, we still have you know, a, a, a larger period of time um, where a biggest or a bigger uh, amount or a larger amount of financial funds want to be injected into to Paraguay. And in order to do that, uh, we need a new architecture of, of the Annex C. And this is my proposal today. That is the first idea. And is to have a binary tariff for e -table. A binary tariff means that we are going to, to have an energy tariff from on, on, on the one hand which is going to be related to the royalty from and the administrative compensation <clears throat> according to that formula 
and the royalties are indexed to the energy actually generated. And a power tariff, a power tariff is going to be indexed by the dividends, which is a constant amount of money, and the OPEX, which is the money or the fans which uh, ETPU needs in order to operate in an efficient way. And we need to assure ETPU that it's going to have available this, this amount of, of, of money, that budget, in order to, uh, to rent uh, efficiently. Even if we we have uh, uh, bad conditions uh, in, in a logical regime or in energy demand, as we are going to see later, and this is going to be still a power tariff. That means that uh, from a scenario where we have just a power tariff, we just re uh, rent our oven. Now we are going to rent our oven, and with that that um, income, we are going to be able to maintain our oven, and we are going to be able to pay all the the workers our in our bakery and and so on and so far, and and beside that, we are going to be also a seller of the bread. That's why we are going to to have an energy tariff. And, and this is the, the first, the third uh, corollary, which said that a uh, binomial uh, or binary tariff uh, can provide a competitive cost in need table, and the financial fund uh, could stem from the judgment of the compensation of a recession. And this is, uh, I didn't say that, uh, that uh, this, this also is going to. Uh, let us to have a very cheap uh, energy in ET2 because we just put away the debt and we are going to have a cheap electricity price in ET2, in Paraguay and, and in Brazil. And in Brazil, because of, of the uh, scale of, 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 of its markets, we are going to, to, we still have the possibility to adjust and the compensation for energy session and even with that situation is a competitive uh, cost for for the brazilian market and paraguay can't uh, receive financial form, uh, funds in order to invest in infrastructure education health service and so on and so forth and um, but here is the, the, the last fact, the, the fact number four, which say that the financial revenues from Paraguayan electricity rely on variables beyond the ETAPU treaty. That means that it's not enough just to set a compensation for electricity session in a, uh, in a good, wait for, for, for Paraguay and, and, and Brazil, but, but the financial revenue depends on other uncertain variables which are beyond the control of, of ETAPO. And, and here we, 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 we can see this, that's the, with the business as usual scenario. And that means that, that with a single uh, compensation for energy session, the financial revenue is equal to the compensation for any recession plus times times the Paraguayan uh, energy demand in Brazil. That means that uh, the Paraguayan energy that Brazil demand or consume. And on the other case uh, where we are already uh, selling, not or only, uh, it's not only a session, we are already selling the, the electricity from Paraguayan electricity from Itaipu. And our financial revenue is going to be the energy price of the market and the Paraguayan energy the times the Paraguayan energy demand in the imported uh, markets. And, and, and here we can see that we have two variables or uh, in the case of the energy exportation scenario and one variable which is the Paraguayan energy demand in Brazil in the business as usual scenario, which are beyond the control of Paraguay. Which is a, and 
what are the, the variables, yes? And the Paraguayan uh, energy demand for exportation uh, variables are the Paraguayan energy availability for exportation. That means the, the amount of electricity that Paraguay uh, have for, for, for exportation. The time, because the electricity demand is very variable and depend on what hour of the day is, what month of the year is, and also what year is. And also the hydrological condition in the market, the wind availability, the solar availability in, in the uh, import uh, market, and then new generations in uh, projects which are in service, the availability of infrastructure and generation, transmission, distribution, and obviously the cost of Paraguayan energy for exportation and the only electricity price of the important market that is in the case that Paraguay is selling its energy and and here maybe one of the important issues is the Paraguayan energy availability for exportation and that Paraguayan energy availability for exportation uh, rely on, on on these variables yes the Paraguayan internal demand that means that when the Paraguayan internal demand grow we have less electricity for for exportation and, and its Paraguayan internal demand also uh, uh, is very variable and depend on the hour, the demand of the year, and also the aerological condition in, in Itipu. If we don't have water, we, don't, we are not going to have uh, available energy for exportation. Also, the new generations projects in service in Paraguay, which are going to cover part of, of the Paraguayan energy internal demand, and, and also the availability of transmission infrastructure. We need to bring the electricity for Nitepo to the market. And here we have then the, the corollary number five, which is that the Paraguayan energy exportation feasibility depends on both cost of Paraguayan in Itepu and the spot, the on the spot energy price and the imported market. And um, what is the uh, on on the spot energy price? And this is the case from for for Brazil, uh, particularly. And the driver variables for the on the spot energy price or the electricity price is obviously the electricity demand. Uh, the hydrological conditions, the wind, solar energy availability, the geo geo geographical location of the markets, and the transmission system and the generation union availability. And here we can see the spot price of, of the Brazilian uh, markets. And we, see, we can see that it's very, very variable. That means that it's changing a lot according with these variables. We, we cannot think in a flat rate if we want to sell our electricity always a uh, 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 market price and and obviously this volat volatility this level of volatility is posed to the seller on a very very huge risk a risk that can be or should be managed in order to um, to avoid losses, losses uh, that even can uh, drive the company to the bankrupt. And in the case that we <clears throat> compare, yes, that situation which is very volatile, with a, a scenario where we, when we have a fixed level of uh, compensation for any recession. We think that here, according to the spot markets, there are situations where the seller is losing uh, money because the, the, uh, the, the market price is bigger than the energy uh, session compensation, the compensation for energy session. And there is a region where the buyer, the buyer, uh, el comprador está, uh, is, is losing money because uh, he's paying more for uh, he's paying more money 
for, for or, or a larger price for the electricity than the, the, the market price. This situation led us to, to, to see that the benefit from a given level of compensation depend on the market price risk because could a pure situation where we uh, we have a winning situation and when we have a also um, a losing situation then we here came the the second idea and is a new compensation instrument and this is based on the idea of, of, of transforming uh, a distributed element into a congruent element. It's similar to what uh, Christine said, that we would need to transform a position with a zero-sum zero game, uh, a win-loss game, uh, to a win-win game. And, and here we need to evolve from the figure to, of a fixed compensation to a figure of a price and urological risk management instrument. And this can be made by derivative, uh, derivative assets like uh, options. And probably most of you know that uh, uh, the call and the put options. And this um, option could provide us a, a seller hedging scenario uh, or a buyer hedging scenario according how is settling the, the option. And, and we also have al always the, possi the possibility to remain on a fixed compensation level or, a, or think or analyze a free trade scenario in Brazil. That is free trade without risk uh, hedging. And here we have the first, the first scenario where we, uh, we have a fixed unique income. Uh, which that doesn't depend on the spot market price, which is completely opposite to the scenario where we have a free trading in the power markets. Uh, here, we uh, our unit income is equal to, to the uh, market price always. And if we constitute the, the, our hedging instrument in the way of a path option, we are setting a, a floor, yes, a floor for the unit income. And beyond the floor, the floor uh, after that uh, floor, we are going to be able to sell up the uh, market price. That is a situation when we, we have a seller hedging, a risk hedging. And, and first, uh, uh, lately, we have the, the scenario number four, which is a call option or a buyer uh, risk hedging, where we are setting a cap for the unit income. That means that here we are going to have a selling at the price market. And when we re reach this price cap, we are going to be stopped here. And that means that we are adding a second question at our negotiation table. We are not just uh, negotiating uh, what is going to be the level of the uh, compensation for energy session, but also we are asking or we are negotiating who is going to pay the risk, take the price risk and take the hydrological risk. And according to that, we are going to hear this, this uh, scenario here. For the first is the business as usual scenario where the price risk is shared. And here we are going to increment the compensation, let's say a medium, yeah? But if, the, if Paraguay is, is taking the price risk, like in a call option scenario, the, the increment of the compensation should be very large. And, and if, the, if Brazil, uh, t uh, take the, the price risk in a put scenario, here our increment of compensation could be, could be minor because uh, above that, uh, th that level, which is set by the floor of, of the put, Paraguay is going to be able to sell at the, 
at the market price. Then finishing, uh, we 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 shared uh, with you four four facts. The first fact is that the Amex C of Treaty of Itaipu must be revised in the year 2023. The second was that Paraguay's power demand is growing at a very fast pace, exceeding the rate of the energy growth. The third is that Paraguay needs financial resources and a competitive tariff for transforming energy into development. And the fourth is that Paraguayan financial revenues from Paraguay's electricity rely on variable beyond the Itaipu Treaty. And this also is our rely on uh, seven corollaries. Um, the first is that Itaipu sells, sells uh, power, not energy. And the second is that Paraguay will soon pay it, uh, for all its uh, power, and it's going to be sooner than uh, the moment that Paraguay uh, in the par which Paraguay paid for all its uh, uh, energy. The third is that Paraguayan energy exportation feasibility depends on both um, the cost of Paraguayan Itaipu energy and on the spot energy price of the important market. The fourth is Paraguay demand in any market is subject to the Paraguayan energy uh, availability for exportation because even in this case, even if Paraguay have the uh, the demand on any market, if we are not having availability of that energy we are not going to be able to support it the co corollary number five is that the benefit from a given compensation level depend on the market price risk the seventh uh, the corollary number number six is that the benefit from a given compensation level depend on the uh, it's mistake i think and the last one is that the negotiation of on the increase in the level of compensation can be based on the definition of of the property uh, property uh, price risk and to end i would like to share also uh, again with you two two quotes and um, the first is a quote of, of the writer of, of a happy world Aldous Hoffley, and he said that facts do not set to exist because they are ignored. And also, Marcus Aurelius uh, said that everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is a perspective, not a true. I would like to thank also all the people that uh, contribute with me in order to be able to present these ideas with you uh, today. Thank you very much, and now we are open to, to the discussion, I guess. Well, uh, that was a lively conversation. Thank you, Dr. Folch and Dr. Blanco for the valuable information that you have shared with us. Now I will let you with Mr. Aníbal Duarte. Uh, he is a vice president of the Paraguayan Student Association and actual student of Master of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Melbourne. Welcome, Mr. Duarte. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Dr. Gerardo, Dr. Christine. That was actually a very amazing presentation. And I think we also have, uh, we are, everyone is, op both of you are open for questions and at the moment, so if the participants want to share or ask any questions, just feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you if you want to talk or if you can just write it down for us as well. I have one here, it says, considering that one of the strategies to transform energy into development is industrialization, how, how can we foster local industry and thus prioritize national industries? Uh, go, go ahead, Christine. Go ahead. <laughs> and this is also, I also just want to say that this is something that HISA has done a lot of work on. Um, so, so just to say, I, I just because I'm speaking first doesn't mean that there isn't actually 
you know, Gerardo, I'm sure has some things he should be able to say about this as well. Um, I think that um, one, you know, if, if you look at Paraguay from the outside, some, there are some characteristics that rise to the top. Um, you know, I think if you're in Paraguay, like Paraguay feels really normal for you. And so maybe sometimes we need an outside perspective to know here are the things that are, uh, that, that are very notable. One of the things that's very notable about Paraguay is that all of your electricity is renewable. Um, I mean, there, you know, except for when the like, electricity goes out and you have to have some generators. But really, the energy matrix is renewable. This is remarkable. This is a plus. This means anything produced in Paraguay through electricity at this point is, you can stamp it green. Um, now that's a pro. Now let's talk about some of the challenges. Um, one of the challenges in Paraguay is a lack of long-term public policies that go beyond individual governments. Um, without long-term planning, and of course, what Gerardo Blanco was referencing today in terms of these, the put and call options, this, this, would have, this is long-term planning of, about how prices are going to change and about how income changes. Paraguay has to develop, and the people who have to push for this are you all. It's the Paraguayan public. This is, it's the Paraguayan citizenry that has to push for this. Um, it is the young people on this call that have to push for an industrialization plan that takes into account what kinds of industries are beneficial to the country. Um, and this kind of long-term planning has to be something that is not going to change depending on who's president. Um, unfortunately, right now, the way Paraguay works is that you get, you, you get new policies every single five years or shorter um, because people come into ministries and they say, I want to do something totally different from the people before, rather than thinking, I want to build on excellence that has already happened. Um, so, thinking about how do you foster local industries and prioritize national industries in order to, you know, et cetera, what has to happen is the citizenry needs to push and the universities need to push and say, we want to design an industrialization plan that puts Paraguay on the front of global trends. Um, so, you need university researchers to come up with ideas um, and the people in the university are brilliant and they're creative. And then what has to happen is those things have to be implemented and the push for this has to come. It's not gonna come from the government because it hasn't. It hasn't come from the government. It has to come from the private sector, from civil society, from students, et cetera. Um, and so I think one of the, what, so, so there needs to be a national conversation on this and you all have to push for this. Um, and then we have to leverage the experience that you know, this is a conference in Australia, and also the United States and Paraguay. Um, and so you who are outside of Paraguay, who are making connections with your peers, with professors, with interesting companies or interesting innovations and interesting ventures, those things have to be connected to this industrialization plan. Um, and, and, you know, it has to be built in that way. It's not, it's not gonna come from the government. It's gonna have to come from the university from private sector, from, from civil society, and also, of course, government solutions. Thank you so much. That was very clarifying. Uh, also, the, uh, prof I think uh, the professor, Steve Fisher, he's asking, he's saying, thank you for the very engaging presentation. Both countries have been through something big shift in political ideology as their government have changed in the last 10 to 15 years. How do these changes affect the ability of the country to re renegotiate their agreement and also are fact enough? Uh, yep. I think... I think both of us can answer part of this question. Gerardo, if you want to take it first. I can repeat the question again. Uh, how do these changes affect the ability of the countries to renegotiate the agreement regarding to the changing in government, or I would say, yeah, the changing government? And if are these facts are fact enough to do this? 
Yes, actually, it's a very big challenge that both country, Paraguay and Brazil, have elections in 2022 in Brazil and 2023 in Paraguay. But that's is uh, some people can maybe think that that's a risk, but I see that like an opportunity because for sure the next president of Brazil and the next president of Paraguay is going to be have to be involved in the Itaipu issue because of their campaigns, because of the magnitude of, of this issue and its uh, negotiation process. And and also the, the Congress, because we, we, we need to, to know that the final treaty or the final revision of the Annex C has to be approved by the Brazilian and the Paraguayan Congress uh, and congressmen. And that means that uh, we, both countries, have a very a big, a very large opportunity to select our future congressmen according to also to the with the knowledge that the, the that people have about this important issue for both countries um oh, i don't want to stop but i i have um yeah go on. this is so so um what Gerardo said about opportunity is really great um and i just want to flag that um so this question of how do these ideological changes these shifts right so paraguay and brazil have moved potentially from, from one side to another side in terms of ideology um, in the last 10, 15 years. How do these changes affect the ability of the countries to renegotiate their agreement? This is where I think uh, the historical research is very helpful. Um, I, you know, uh, Fundación Getulio Vargas has on the internet um, documents from the 1970s renegotiation or the, the negotiation for uh, what resulted in the tripartite agreement between Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. Um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. Uh, this is available on the internet. Uh, most of it is in Portuguese, some of it is in Spanish, um, because they're official documents, some of them were classified, most of them were classified, and they're all put together and they're all available. In, and this is just one set of documents that the Fundación de Tulio Vargas has from the Ministry of Foreign Relations, from Itamaraty. When we look at that, and we look at the focus of those documents, it becomes very clear that Brazil, we, we learn a lot about Brazil, and we learn a lot about Paraguay in the 1970s. And one of the things we see is a, this trend of, of Brazil focusing on energy for industrialization. That's one very important data point. Now, if we take that thread all the way to the present and we think about the regimes in Brazil of the 21st century, Lula, Dilma, Bolsonaro, if we follow all the way through, we actually see that ideology doesn't shift the focus of Brazil. I mean, it does, it's sort of on the media, but in terms of what's happening with Itaipu, there's a real steady focus on the energy. So what does that mean? It means that, that ideology is important, but ideology is superficial to interest. <laughs> um, and, so, and so what I wanna say is that, you know, how does this affect uh, the ability to negotiate? I think it shouldn't. Or I think that perhaps stronger negotiations are not based on ideology, but on interest. Um, and so, so that's the first answer I want to put there. This is why history, why studying the documents is really useful. And then the question, are facts enough? Because Gerardo Blanco has argued, we need to, we need to start with facts. And so he gave, I mean, he's given a lot, a lot of facts. And so I, I think it's not just that are facts enough. I, I think the question is, how do we communicate the facts? Like, how do we help people understand them? And one of the things about the dynamic of Itaipu and Paraguay is that, um, is that uh, there hasn't been a lot of, com uh, th there's more room for conversation for people who work in Itaipu, like Gerardo Blanco, speaking to a public. And that's exactly what he's doing right now, of course, right? Um, so that the public can actually ask questions like, okay, so we changed the tariff 
for, you know, compensation, but how many more years of compensation does Paraguay have? Like, really? If we, if we delink it from power and we put it to energy, how much? And what does that mean for Fonacide? And what does that mean for the municipios that get money for education from Fonacide, from compensación? What are we talking about here? And that's why we need people like Gerardo Blanco, but we also need, you know, educación here to tell us what is going on in terms of the money. Um, because when compensación ends or gets really, really small, what happens to the municipios, the departamentos that use that money to feed children in school, right? And so, so the facts are always being presented. And the question is not just are the facts enough, but, you know, how can we get more and more information and how can we ask questions about the quality of that information? and what that means on the ground. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Dr. Christine. Um, also, I, I would like to give the, the word to Linda. She would like to ask a question live. So go carry on, Linda. Thanks, Aniva. Uh, I just have three questions, but I will try to do it in one. So it's for both of you, because I want to know your point of view in this, in this one. Uh, what is the best strategy for the sustainable development of Paraguay in the renegotiation in the sense uh, or choosing a strategy of uh, a low, medium or high rate or uh, in a power or energy tariffs? Uh, also, is it better to use the energy of Itaipu to develop and industrialize ourselves as a country or to sell uh, our part to third parties, not only to Brazil. And all, uh, the last one is, is it is true that it's better to sell energy rather than power as we're doing now with Itaipu? And I have an understanding that Brazil is selling power to third parties. So it's not the same to talk about selling, sorry, Brazil is selling energy rather than power. So it's not the same. Uh, uh, regarding money because you you have more energy than power so at the end it's about uh, getting more uh, money uh, from these sellings so that's my three questions trying to reduce in one thanks well, I hate to hear. <laughs> those are great <laughs> Pick, pick, pick two, pick two, you, yeah. and, and then yeah. I ask you. Um, the remain. So, um, so the best strategy for negotiation is to come up with a plan. Uh, the low, the medium, the high tariff, all of them can work. They won't work if there isn't a plan. And the plan is for how to use the surplus money, right? So, so right now, Itaipu has, a, a, you know, has a, a tariff of around $43, $44 per megawatt hour. Um, now, what happens when 60% of the tariff, according to a conservative interpretation of the treaty, um, when, when that price drops by 60% because the debt is zeroed out, is the tariff drops, right? And so then people are talking about, do we have, you know, what, what's gonna, is it gonna be $19 per megawatt hour or are we gonna find, are we gonna keep the price at $44 per megawatt hour and take this $2 billion that now goes to debt, divide 1 billion, 1 billion, 1 billion for Paraguay, 1 billion for Brazil, that's the high rate. A medium rate is somewhere in between and then the question is, how do you get that to happen? And of course that requires negotiation because it requires a change. Um, all of those options actually can work. The problem is not a low, a medium, and a high tariff. The problem is for what end? If you have a low electricity tariff, but no plan for how to sell this electricity in strategic ways, not just residential use, as Gerardo Blanco mentioned, but actually industry, then what happens is that this increased demand that we saw on his graphs 
means that that electricity goes to air conditioners and pretty lights and a lost opportunity for power by a plan for new energy sources for more industry development industrial development helps mitigate that now if if for example for some reason brazil the brazilian congress decided it was okay to keep the price where it is if somehow that could pass brazil's congress the question is one billion dollars on each side for what or, or two billion dollars inside each side for what purpose if there is a vision for creating a financial investment bank inside Itaipu, uh, transforming the Paraná into a transnational hydrological energy instrument, maybe that, that could be amazing if there's a plan. And a plan is necessary to administer the resources well, but also to convince both Congresses to vote for the changes. And the plan has to be in the interest, if, if we're gonna change things, it has to be in the interest of both countries in order for it to pass. So, so you know, what's the best strategy? A plan. Um, and a plan that thinks about the strategic interests of both sides. Um, and so, and, and then this question of, of you know, of ventas a terceros, it's always, you know, we hear that a lot. Um, when we talk about, you know, what should Paraguay do? Maybe what Paraguay could do is take its, like, the electricity that is produced, that is generated, but it's not planned on, you know, it's not contracted in the Anexo C, um, this additional energy that could be 1,000 gigawatt hours, 20,000 gigawatt hours a year, it, you know, uh, the excess that comes from a well-run dam, you know, maybe we could sell it to, to terceros, the question is who and how. Um, I think one of the questions I would also want to throw in here is what does climate change do to these numbers? Because in the last two years, Itaipu has generated a, just above its guaranteed electricity, uh, its, its guaranteed electricity, which is around 75,000 gigawatt hours. Um, if, if this continues, it means that the sort of the amount of money and the amount of energy we've been thinking about that will come from Ethiopia is not is not the same. We've been thinking about it as a 90, 95,000, 100,000 gigawatt hour dam, but actually climate change absolutely drastically affects the dam. Why? Because less water in the reservoir means less energy, um, and you know silted up rivers mean not great turbines. And so I think that, you know, part of what has to happen in terms of what's a good strategy for negotiation, actually looking at these different risks, the climate change risks, the government institutionality risks, like what happens when you have a, a government that depends on energy rent for current costs, like all of this actually has to be on the table. A plan mitigates all of those problems. So that's my a few points. Great, Christine. Uh, may I add my two cents to these questions? Anibal, we have still time? Yeah, go on, go on, sure thing. Okay, I will try to, to be brief. Um, yes, I think that is a, a great question, Linda, um, and also was a, a great uh, uh, answer from Christine. And I think that is very important. I think it's very important to do the math, but what's more important to do the math is the aftermath. Why we are negotiating into Itaipu? Why? For what? I think that is the, the, the first question that we should try, should try to, to answer. And when I say this is because here we, uh, present the problem like a, some kind of di dilemma. Uh, and we see wh what we have, want. We want uh, rent, we want money, or we want uh, cheap electricity for consumption, for industry, for 
uh, workplaces and so on and so far. And and we 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 don't we we already don't know, do not decide what we want. We we want rent or we want electricity. And and we we should ask uh, add to that what Brazil wants and what Brazil wants uh, cheap electricity. But not only cheap electricity, because but Brazil also faced some kind of dilemma and cheap electricity or secure electricity. What I prefer. And I think maybe I am a little bit optimistic. But I think we 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 are we are able to to have all of that. Maybe we need to adjust slightly our vision and our perspective, and we 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 will be able to have cheap and secure electricity for Brazil and cheap electricity for Paraguay, and and uh, and also funds and also rent for investing in cross cutting uh, they mentioned that we need in order to be able to consume all or our electricity producing value because we need to make all the uh, series of questions because if we start saying okay we want money money for what money for investing in infrastructure and education and so on and so forth and why we want to invest in education and infrastructure for having uh, industrial development and why we want uh, industrial development for creating jobs uh, and why we want creating jobs and 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 i think we, we we need to go ahead and at the end we are going to reach what i think is or should be the the biggest uh, interest of Paraguay in all this process with this human dignity. We want to build up and we want to accumulate human dignity with this process. And this process has to be, we need to be only the spark that starts not a revolution, but a renouncement and a, a enlightenment process that allows our countries to make with a lead faith also a leap into the development. And the tariff is not, I think, the, the most important issue here. I think the most important issue is, on one hand, not the tariff, but the incomes, <laughs> because you know that the tariff doesn't define how much money, how, how much funds you're going to receive far away. What is going to define that and all the other uh, chains uh, is, is the income. And the income, you know, is price of tariffs plus or times quantity. And that's why we need to uh, uh, develop uh, instruments that allow us to manage all these two variables, tariff and quantity and that is one of the benefits of that that option that i uh, just showed you because when you have a, a low price market probably that means that you have a lot of water and if you have a lot of water you have a lot of quantity you have a decrement of the tariffs of the price, but you have an increment which balance our income. And the same happens when you have a high prices in Brazil, because high prices like now, for instance, means that you don't have so much water. And if you have not so much water, probably they pull as just uh, Christine just mentioned the quantity that Itaipu is going to be able to produce is going to be low. That means that you have a very high price, but a big, uh, a low quantity, and all, also 
your income is going to be balanced. And what is really important is that all the financial resources that Paraguay can capture from this process should be invested in order to be able to consume in a productive way that electricity. And on that way, we are going to be compensating the, the thing that our incomes are going to be reducing, but the value that we are going to be creating with that el electricity that we are now consuming is going to be increasing. And, and again, and we need to bear in mind that our final uh, objective is the people. Is the people, and, and I, I said, and I always said that the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, energy resource of Paraguay is its young population, and and we are just um, transforming not only the electricity into development, but the energy of that people into their own development. Thank you so much. Uh, you want to continue, sir? I, I think it's, uh, our time is done. I, I want to respect people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we still have a few questions, but I think we, we, we're running low here with the time. Um, you, you can forward us that, that, that question, and we, we think we'll try to answer afterwards yeah. if we are running out of time. OK, we're, we're, I'm going to take your word for that. Um, Thank you so much for today. This was really an amazing exposition for both of you to be, um, particularly myself, I learned a lot and, um, and thank you for that. Um, we, we also want to be say, uh, say thank you to all the participants that we are here today. Hopefully it was uh, as productive as for you for, as was for me as well. Uh, I, I also would like to invite you for tomorrow. We have had our last day of uh, the Paraguay Speaks. Um, the, 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 the topic for tomorrow is why does Paraguay recognize Taiwan and shun China? So you are more than, than welcome to join us as well. Um, yeah, that, that, that should be all. Uh, let me just take here one more question. Yeah. I will, I will forward you the questions because it's getting more and more uh, here. So thank you so much. Um, have a, a good day or night or I don't know what time of the, are you over there? And hope to see you soon again. Cheers. Bye.